So it always comes down to this. Are things getting better or are they getting worse? We've had many technological utopians on the stage, including the legendary Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. And, uh, and indeed, we've presented many, many modern miracles right here. On the other hand, we wake up every morning to the latest news of the latest depredations that we experience from modern living. So the first two speakers in this next grouping are basically here to say, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> Things are not as bad as they seem, while the two that follow want us to confront the hidden threats posed by our new digital world and by the Internet's seductive usefulness and apparent friendliness. We're going to begin with Mr. Paul Robinson, whose talk is The World is Not a Dangerous Place. Paul. Thank you. So we all set up him. Oh, we need to go back. But... Good morning. I'm going to bring you some good news today. This isn't what you normally hear. Politicians, journalists, security experts line up to tell you that the world is a dangerous place. And not only that it is a dangerous place, but that it is more dangerous than it used to be. In fact, it is more dangerous now than ever. If you take your news from the television, you might be excused for thinking that the world is on fire. My general reaction to this is to ask, well, more dangerous than what? Precisely. I'm a historian. I write history books. You can buy some of them upstairs in, in lunchtime if you like. I'll sign them for you. Uh, and as a historian, when I hear people say the world is more dangerous, I want to know their point of comparison historically. And I don't think that it is some distant danger like the Black Death or the Mongol invasion of Europe. I think they're thinking closer to home, and most often they're, they're talking about the Cold War. And for all its problems, people say at least the Cold War was stable and orderly, whereas now we have chaos, and that's more dangerous. But is it? What I want to do today is to show you that the answer is a categorical no. By historical standards, we live in a remarkably safe and peaceful era. The world is not more dangerous at all. And to illustrate this, I'm going to start off by introducing you to a Soviet sailor called Vasily Alexandrovich Arkhipov, if we can get him here somehow. He may well be the reason you are here today. In October of 1962, Arkhipov, in the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, was deputy commander of a Soviet submarine number B-59, shown here, I hope. There we go. And when this submarine came under attack by American destroyers because it was trying to break the blockade of Cuba. And the Soviets were out of radio contact with Moscow, so they thought the fact the Americans were attacking them meant that war had broken out between the United States and the Soviet Union. And on board the submarine, they had nuclear torpedoes. These were only to be used if three people gave permission. The commander, the deputy commander, that's Arkhipov, and the political officer. The commander wanted to fire the nuclear torpedoes at the Americans. So too did the political officer. But Arkhipov said no. The torpedoes were never used. Had they been, it would have been the first use of nuclear weapons since 1945 and would have unlaunched, unlaunched World War III. So in October of 1962, all that stood between the world and nuclear war was one man. If you ever find yourself thinking that the world is more dangerous nowadays, remember Vasily Arkhipov and be grateful that the past is past. To develop this thesis further, I'm now going to show you a chart, and, and charts are, are, are boring, but um, this one's pretty simple. And if you remember nothing else from this presentation, try and remember the chart, because it, it really encapsulates everything I'm trying to say. And what it shows is the magnitude of armed conflict worldwide from 1946 to the present day. And this magnitude is a measurement of how many people are being killed in wars, how many wars there are, uh, how much physical damage is being done. And a group called the Center for Systemic Peace collects 
data on armed conflict and puts this together. Now, bear in mind that this chart starts in 1946, so it doesn't include the Second World War. If it did, that would be on the far left, and the line would shoot way off the top, like that. My mother was brought up in East London in the Second World War during the Blitz. Her father, my grandfather, was a volunteer fireman. He climbed up St. Paul's Cathedral to put up fires. She can remember whole blocks around where she lived, completely flattened by German bombing. One day, she heard a V-1 rocket fly overhead and heard its engine cut off, which was a sure sign that it was about to land and explode. So bear in mind also that however bad things look, even at the top of that chart I showed you, there was something far, far worse which preceded it. So let's go back to the chart. What it shows very clearly is that after a brief pause at the end of the Second World War, armed conflict worldwide drew extre grew extremely rapidly throughout the Cold War period, peaking around 1992, at which point the Cold War came to an end, and since then, armed conflict has plummeted dramatically. So what we need to do now, really, is to, to go through this chronologically to work out what exactly was going on and why it looks the way that it does. And sadly, the, the end of the Second World War didn't mean the end of all wars. Uh, the Civil War in China went on until 1949. The partition of India led to massive intercommunal violence, resulting in a rise in conflict in the late 1940s, culminating in the Korean War in 1950. A member of my family was conscripted in the British Army in the Korean War, at the Battle of Imjin River, his local unit, the Gloucesters, were completely surrounded by the Chinese and captured en masse. Now, fortunately, he, he wasn't in this unit. He was in the 45th Field Regiment of Royal Artillery. But they didn't have a good time either. They're meant to be miles to the rear. But at Imjin, the Chinese came within 200 yards of these guys who had to defend themselves by firing their guns through open sights. This was a really terrible war. 1.2 million people lost their lives. The end of the Korean War produced a, a short-lived reduction in armed conflict worldwide, but by the early 1960s, things were on the rise once again. This was the era of wars of decolonization in places like Algeria, in Malaya, in uh, Kenya with the Mau Mau, in Aden, and so on. And unfortunately, even when these former European colonies got their independence, their, their problems didn't cease. The new states collapsed. Civil wars ensued, coup followed coup, and the result was that the, war, the world became more and more unstable. And making matters worse, we now began to experience a new phenomenon, proxy wars. So previously, that's in Aden, um, in the proxy wars, what happens was that every local conflict now became the playground for the superpowers, who would take sides and give weapons and money to their allies. And the result of this was that wars became bloodier, and also they tended not to end. So the number of conflicts around the world grew and grew. And normally, the superpowers worked through their proxies, but in Vietnam, the Americans got directly involved. By 1968, there were over 500,000 American troops in Vietnam. By the time they left, over 58,000 had lost their lives. That's about nine times as many as in both the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan put together. The Vietnamese suffered even more, about 1.3 million Vietnamese lost their lives. During the Vietnam War, the Americans dropped more bombs on Vietnam than every country in the world put together dropped on one another throughout the entire length of the Second World War. This was a staggeringly violent time. Unfortunately, the end of the Vietnam War produced no more than a, a tiny little dip in armed conflict worldwide. And by the late 1970s, things were in full swing. A lot of Africa was split apart by civil wars, so too was Latin America. So, for instance, uh, people didn't pay a lot of attention to this kind of thing. But in, in Mozambique, for instance, the civil war, which started in 1975, resulted in about 1 million dead and 5 million refugees. The Angolan civil war, which started around the same time, resulted in maybe 800,000 dead. The Cambodian genocide, 1 to 3 million dead. Civil war in Guatemala. 200,000 dead, that in El Salvador, 75,000 dead, and so on and so forth. By the late 1970s, the world was a very dangerous place indeed. And yet, it continued to get worse. In December 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Over a million Afghans lost their lives in the war which resulted. By the mid-1980s, we had Reagan in power, and people were seriously worried 
about nuclear war. I mean, really seriously worried about it. And if you're my age or older, you can probably remember films like The Day After, which began by showing the consequences of a Soviet nuclear strike on the United States. This is really, uh, 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 people were, were really quite worried. Okay? Not about terrorism, but about global nuclear holocaust. Okay? And it was about this time that I joined the British Army, and I went to Berlin, and I crossed through Checkpoint Charlie into the Communist East. Stasi followed me around. It was, it was kind of fun, actually. Uh, 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 and not so fun was I took my p platoon on a patrol of the border between East and West Germany and showed my troops the fence and the minefields and the guard dogs and all the rest of it. And occasionally we'd have these emergency exercises where we had to deploy to our wartime location to prepare for when the Soviet army would invade West Germany. The threat of war was very real and it was enormous. The Soviets had thousands of tanks and artillery pieces and nuclear weapons ready to use at a moment's notice, and so too did the West. The world stood on the brink of destru destruction. And then suddenly, in the early 1990s, the Soviet Union collapsed, the Cold War came to an end, and with that came peace. Now, of course, there were, there were still new wars. There were wars in the Balkans and in Congo. Now we have war in Ukraine and in the Middle East. But many, many other conflicts came to an end. So, in 1991, in Southeast Asia, the United Nations brokered peace process brought peace at last to Cambodia. In Africa, many civil wars came to an end. Peace came to Namibia in 1990, to Mozambique in 1992, to Angola in 2002, and so on. Similar process in Central America. The civil war in Nicaragua ended in 1990, that in El Salvador in 1992, that in Guatemala in 1996. In South America, insurgencies ran out of steam. So, for instance, in Peru, following the capture of their leader, Abumel Guzman, the Shining Path guerrillas had almost entirely ceased activity by the end of the 1990s, and today we can see the, the uh, violence in, in Colombia with FARC and so on is down dramatically too. Historically, most people in war have not died through battle but through disease. And a great development of the last 20 years is that the United Nations and other organizations have been much more effective at delivering medical assistance to war-struck populations. The result is many fewer civilians dying as an incidental side effect of war. And you put all this together, and what you get is that by 2007, 15 years after the end of the Cold War, the magnitude of armed conflict worldwide had declined by 60%. And this is where people get a little twitchy because they didn't expect this. And they go, yeah, OK, yeah, but, but what about terrorism, OK? You know, maybe all that's true and we don't have so many wars. But surely, you know, we've, we have a bigger problem from terrorism. Well, not so. Take, for instance, North America, where we live. This chart shows the number of terrorist incidents in North America from 1970 through to the present day. And as you can see, there was an awful lot more terrorism in North America in 1970. In fact, the late 1960s, early 1970s were, were quite a violent time. This was a period of groups like the, the Black Panthers and the Weather Underground. In Canada, we had the Front de Liberation du Québec, the FLQ. A family friend was a, a grad student at McGill. Around this time, she told me that uh, she'd been thinking of staying on to do a PhD, and then one day, the FLQ blew up her lecture theater, and she decided that, you know, really, there were better places to be. My students do not have to worry about someone blowing up a lecture theater. It just, just doesn't happen. And by the mid-1970s, really, terrorism in North America ha had declined very, very dramatically. There, there was a brief upsurge in the early 1990s associated with right-wing militia groups. But following the Oklahoma bombing of 1995, these were largely discredited. And since then, the number of terrorist incidents in North America has been consistently low. Elsewhere in the world, terrorism peaked um, in the early 1980s, late 1970s. Uh, this was a period in which nationalist groups like the IRA here were very active as two were left-wing organizations like the Red Army Faction, the Red Brigades, Action Direct, and all these guys. By the mid-1980s, the epicenter of world terrorism had shifted to Latin America. But in the 1990s, the collapse of Latin America's military dictatorships meant that there was also a precipitous decline in terrorism in Latin America. The result is most of the world now has a lot less terrorism than it used to. And what terrorism remains is very highly localized. So in last year, in 2014, 
81% of all terrorist incidents worldwide took place in just five countries shown here in blue. That's Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Syria. So yes, it is true that if you live in one of those five countries, the world has become more dangerous for you. But most of the world is safer. You are many times more likely to die by being bitten by an insect, crushed by a snake, or coming into contact with cold tap water, hot tap water, than you are to be killed by a terrorist. And it's not just terrorism which has declined, so too has murder of all sorts, as we can see here. This shows homicide rates in Canada. They shot up dramatically in the 1960s, peaked around 1975, and have gone downhill ever since. And you can find similar charts for uh, countries throughout the Western world. Soviet sailor Vasily Arkhipov died in 1998. He therefore lived through almost the entire period I have talked about today. And the world he left was far from a perfect one. I'm not trying to say this is a perfect world. Merely, it was a lot better than the world he saved 36 years previously. And our failure to recognize this constitutes really quite an extraordinary failure of collective memory. And for younger people who can't remember the Cold War, this is perhaps excusable. For older generations, there really is no excuse at all. Okay? Uh, there's nothing to be nostalgic about. Today, we have fewer wars, less terrorism, and less murder than at any time in my life. The odds that anybody in this room will die at the hands of another human being are lower than at almost any time in recorded history. There has rarely been a better time to be alive. And I find I still actually have a minute left, so I'm going to go on a little impromptu rant at the end and just say why this matters. And it matters because the fear-mongering has really negative effects on public policy. It leads us to do all sorts of things we don't need to do. We invade and bomb other countries. We curb our civil liberties. We incarcerate more and more people. And none of it is necessary. <laughs> this is a golden age. Go out and enjoy it. Thank you. You see, you see, I told you you would feel better. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you.